people in here, they've been inside from the start. They haven't had to survive. And they just don't get it. They can't. The very thing that makes you different is what makes you special. Hmm, now I'm all warm and fuzzy inside. To fight for this city. To be the symbol of hope that the arrow never was. I am the Green Arrow. We're so weird. Yes. I'm glad the people that listen to us know our quirks and idiosyncrasies by now. <laughs> I hope we're a likable weird as opposed to just an annoying weird. Well, we seem to be. I the hope so. listen to us seem to like it. Well, we like so. them, so hopefully they like very, us in return. Very much. We have a rapport. Hi, everyone. Hi. This is the Fandom Zone, episode 51. We just recorded episode 50 yesterday, and that should be out very soon. We had a really great time. Yes, we did. Uh, But now we're back to our regular format, and it's episode 51 of the Fandom Zone. I'm Karen, and I'm here with Charles. Hi, Charles. Hello, Karen. How are you today? I'm good. I got a new cup of coffee, so I'm ready to go. Yeah, I understand you've got, uh, what's, what's the name of that coffee there? Bitch slap coffee. Bitch slap coffee. <laughs> so you've got damn good bitch slap and hot. And hot. That's right. From my dear friend, Jesse. And uh, and my dear this, friend, Jesse. That's right. Our dear friend, Jesse. Our dear friend. Right. We can share. Uh, again, it's episode 51. And we will be talking about these shows, The Walking Dead 12, Lucifer 7, Gotham, Gotham. 13, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. 11, Legends of Tomorrow 8. So we don't have as many shows as we have had, but it's quite a load of shows. Yeah, five, it's still five shows. Right. So you're going to be here a while. You might as well get comfy. That's wherever, right. Wherever, you are, wherever you're listening to us. Yeah, put us on pause. Go grab yeah. something to drink and a and, snack. Unless you have us like on your, your uh, iPod or whatever while you're uh, walking. Yeah, exactly. Then you, then you can't sit down, but right. or you know, put us on if you're getting ready to drive somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Enjoy the easy, easy listening sounds of Karen and Charles. <laughs> right. And I may actually sing during this episode. I'm oh. just warning you up front. Oh, you in, are you in the mood? No, I have uh, one of the story titles is a song that I uh, sang uh, earlier this week, and uh, I'm sing. looking forward to it. Okay. So, let's start with The Walking Dead, shall we? Yes, let's shall. All right. So, The Walking Dead, Season 6, Episode 12, Not Tomorrow Yet. Yeah, written by Seth Hoffman, directed by Greg Nicotero. Yep. And as we know, Greg Nicotero loves blood and guts and violence and that sort of thing. And as... A little side, and I know if you watch the show, you already know this, but the heads, one of them was modeled off of Greg Nicotero's head. Right. right. And one of the other ones was Johnny Depp's head. Which is hilarious. You're right. I want to know, I what, Johnny, know. I wanna know what Johnny Depp's head was doing just lying around. Well, no, the, apparently they had gotten it from a cast of his head that they took from one of the pirate movies. Okay. One of the Pirates of the Caribbean or something? Right. They had it. I don't know. Someone had worked on that or something. Mm. That's what I heard, at least. So who knows where they (laughs) where it trickled down from. But um, at least it wasn't like Game of Thrones where they ended up on pikes. Right. Exactly. Because we know how that went down, don't we? Right. Right. (laughs) Um, I thought it was pretty funny, though, that they took zombie heads and they used it to look like uh, Gregory's head. Yep. it's actually a pretty clever idea, and it's a good it's a good use of uh, resources. That's right, recycling. Yeah, just, you're recycling. They're recycling the zombies. That's good. That's very it's very environmentally friendly. 
That's right. Use every part of the zombie. Yep. Waste <laughs> not, want not. That's right. Um, make a purse out of the rest of it. or Yeah, you exactly. Know. You know, do a little artsy craftsy thing, you know, sure. like maybe you could uh, make a nice little cat bed out of one or, sure. you, know, you know. Yeah, scrapbook with yeah. some. Yep. A, a nice little fleece blanket of skin. Sure. You know, stuff. <laughs> this is disgusting and I need to stop talking about it. Um, so I have my story titles. Okay. And Hit, have a. Uh, run us what? down. Sure. The A story is Raid Kills All Bugs Dead. Mm hmm. Uh, love won't keep us together. Love. Love won't love keep us together. Keep us that is not the singing one that I did, but it, you know, might as well do that one. Yep. And bargain with the devil. And that's the ending part where they haven't bargained yet, but bargain with the devil. Right. Oh, exactly. Sorry, I'm thinking of something else. Yeah. <laughs> there is a song similar. I know. That's right. I was okay. thinking of running with the devil, but yeah. By so the really the, the, the bulk of the episode is the raid on the savior's compound. Raid. No. <laughs> Raid! <laughs> <laughs> if if any of you remember those commercials for Raid, that's... yeah, we're date we're kind of dating ourselves with that, but yeah, we are very much. We, we they do were that cool. every... they were cool commercials, little yeah. animated things. The cartoon bugs. Hey, if you can make a bug spray Raid. commercial interesting, kudos to you. So they did. And they, they did. did cause they we did. remember them exactly. All these right? decades later, right? And then they would sit. They would you know make the the can of raid mm -hmm. sit down on the counter really hard thunk and then they go, Doom. Raid yeah. kills all bugs dead right <laughs> i mean it was a pretty violent commercial really if you think about it well especially but, if you were like an animal activist or you know well a bug activist bug activist yeah if you yeah if you Not were animal, in, so much, that's but. true yeah if you were into <laughs> insects you were like traumatized by that commercial Right. Right. So now, um, if you watch The Talking Dead like we do, you know that this was Glenn's first kill of someone who was alive. Right. Yeah, we got a lot of kill counts in this episode. Yeah, of live people. Mm -hmm. Not zombies so much. And this was something that I was struggling with because we know reading the comic that the saviors are not good people. Right. But how did they know? Just going off of strangers' words. Yeah, they're really going by just what like Jesus said, right? Essentially, and what you know they. But to be fair, they did encounter that motorcycle group. Sure. So they've kind of they have supporting arguments for their theory. Right. But still, it was a little. It's kind of rash, but uh. I get I, I'm I, I get where especially Rick is coming from because I figure well, his whole approach is that. You know, we, we got to be proactive. We can't wait to find out how they are, especially considering that, oh, you know, they, they did try to kill some of us previously. Right. Right. So, um, you know, a we good just, offense is a. Yeah. And, you know, and what they've been told. And so it's just everything seemed to be like adding up to like bad news. So I think they just decided to be proactive about the whole thing. Yeah. And that's going to come back and bite them in the butt. Yes. Yes, it will. Big time. I just thought it was pretty rash of them and uh, arrogant I and like, yeah, very arrogant to just rush in and do that. Now they hurt them mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's not making a great first impression <laughs> <laughs> on Negan's yeah. people. So. And that's kind of something they've, they brought up that, that Rick really doesn't make good first impressions. Does he? No, no he doesn't. And, uh, yeah, he he left a, a a bit of a a bloody mess in his wake. Yeah. yeah, apparently Rick is the kind of guy that shows up to somebody's like fancy house party and has dog do like stuck on his shoe and dragging it across the carpet. Right, and he knocks over the punch bowl yeah, and exactly, or he gets really angrily drunk and makes a sure. scene. Yeah, and he double dips. <laughs> right, I mean it's just bad news. Yeah. He's bad news all yeah. over the place. Poor yeah. Rick. Everybody's everybody's throwing like throwing shade on Rick in this episode. Well, yeah, I know. Is not deserve it. I mean, it, he kind of deserves. Kind of, yeah. but uh, kind of. I agree. Every time you know, but they every time they need somebody like him. Oh, I guess it's okay. 
Right. Suddenly, except the, for Morgan. They could, except for Morgan, but generally, most everybody cozies up to him when they really, really need him. Right. Even Preacher Man. Yep. Is is yeah. all in. Yeah. Father Gabriel seems to have kind of like bought into the Rick mystique, the Rick Tatorship, a little Rick, bit. <laughs> Rick Tatorship. Yeah. Genius. Oh, uh, I didn't. I didn't originate that one. I can't oh, take credit okay. for it, but yeah, the Rick That's Tatorship. Genius. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, they've slaughtered at least that sect of the saviors Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. Now we know that that isn't all of them, obviously, because at the end of the episode, we get Maggie and Carol have been taken by a secondary group. Yeah. And did you get a really queasy feeling when that news went down? Oh yeah. Yeah. Because you're, because you're thinking of like, Oh, this could play out totally differently. Yeah. You know, Compared to the comic. Right. It yeah. definitely could. It could. Because it is different from the comic. Mm-hmm. So who knows? They could be throwing us a curve. They, yeah. Uh, they have in the past thrown they us have, many. They have. Which is good because it keeps things like not entirely predictable. You kind of have an uh, idea where they're going to go, but you're not entirely sure. You can't bet. You can't go all in right. and, and put all your money on it because right. they, could, they could screw you over in a heartbeat. Right. I like there was a tweet and I replied to it as well where it says the showrunner said that the the introduction of Negan at the end of the season uh, might not be <laughs> it might not be the most pleasant episode and I was like oh really yes yeah it's it's kind <laughs> of the understatement of the century I think right right yeah, this, and season, I was... this season finale I'm 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 guessing Nicotero's Greg Nicotero is going to direct that one because yeah, it's going to be completely horrible. Right. It's going to be. And it's going to end on a big cliffhanger and probably. And I've heard, you know, like I've read some interviews online where like, you know, like various air actors, like the uh, actress that plays Carol, um, you know, she said that uh, she read the script for the season finale and it was just like, oh. She was blown away. Yeah, blown away. Yeah. yeah. So it's not yeah. going to. Yeah. it's they're They're really hyping it a little bit. Right. A lot. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. And, you know, Jeffrey D. Morgan is keeping his mouth shut, but he's he says he's really excited. Well, because that'll probably be, yeah, his debut. Right. And he is, well, they've said that. that yeah. That's yeah. Me. They're saving him for the season finale, which is only what? Um, now, geez. Uh, four, four? Epi- four episodes away. Yeah. Four episodes away. Yeah. And uh, he's he's in it. Now, probably for all of next season. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would think so. Yeah. And uh, I can't wait for that, by the way. But that's good. Though. Is- yeah. Yeah. We're going to get, I mean, this, the way they're setting this up, is, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're biding their time. They're getting things in, in order. And uh, then they're just going to punch you right in the mouth. Right. So right heads, mouth. He- heads up, people. Right. Uh, so the raid ends with. First of all, they've massacred everyone there. And uh, do I have to go into detail? I mean, no, but I mean, yeah, there, I mean, there was some stuff that went down, um, you know, that uh, there's, it was a pretty intense gun battle. Right. And um, you had Carol and Maggie, like Carol had to prevent Maggie from wanting to join the fight. Right. She's like, Which... no. And I thought that was a really cool scene. Mm-hmm. Because but it ended up leading to their yeah their capture their capture apparently which, yeah. yeah it's kind of like a bum, 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 bum. right right exactly yeah it's, but I mean Not but but, but, but Carol was really interesting in that scene where she confronts Maggie because she says you know like this is not what you're supposed to do or but right. not what you're supposed to be something like that mm-hmm. and she was adamant about it right so I think it's just the idea that maybe maybe she it's bothering her that the people that should be really good people are doing these horrible, horrible things now. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of weighing on her conscience. Well, I think she's telegraphing. Mm -hmm. Uh, She doesn't like what she's become and she doesn't want Maggie to become what she's become. Yeah. I think that's part of it. Yeah. But she sees how, how mercenary she is and it starts with her making the cookies right being all domesticated like a mom and you know that was i mean that was kind of hilarious where she's going around town giving everybody cookies and yeah and then but then you find out that oh she left a cookie on sam's grave 
Yeah. After, well, yeah, and, and if you remember, she pretty much traumatized the hell out of Sam. Yeah. With about those cookies. Right. So that's obviously weighing heavily on her. Right. Right. Yeah, that cookie was used with great mm-hmm. um, symbolism in mm-hmm. his room, with the ants crawling all over it. Right. And so yeah, to show the cookies again in this way and to put one on his grave is is a callback in several different ways as well. But it's definitely her trying to be kind of not only to forgive herself, but also to kind of get back a little bit of her humanity, I think, trying to get back a little bit of that. But again, it, it was a huge mistake because that yeah they were in the well, wrong th- place at the wrong time. The way I saw it with, with Carol is that there's a lot going on there. Um, I think a lot of it, it's because she's a mom or was a mom. Right. And Sophia's death is weighing on her. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, like, you know, Lizzie with the flowers taking her mm-hmm. out after, like, Lizzie takes her out the other, her sister, and that was in her care. Mm-hmm. And then now Sam, I think mm-hmm. it's kind of really gnawing at her soul. Yeah. That's why, she, they- that's why she's taken up smoking. <laughs> this is, yeah. This is the episode where they mentioned her being a mother, or was it last episode? I'm not sure. Someone asked her that, you know, you had a kid, right? Or something like that. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. Okay. So um, there was that. There was a heavy gunfight. There was the knifing. Yeah. There, I mean, it was very strategic. Yeah. That, that they went in. And, and then at the end, Maggie and, and Carol were yeah. captured and all that. Yeah. Um, and that was the bargain with the devil. So that's two stories down. Yeah. Now, the side story being the... The hookups and the breakups. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple of breakups mm-hmm. in this episode. Uh, Abraham. Yeah, which we've seen coming a mile away. Yeah, he he gave the brush off yep. in this episode. Yeah, he, and, if, oh. and if he said it so lovingly, <laughs> as only Abraham can, uh, referencing dingleberries. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, the guy's the epitome of class. Yeah, classy with a K, yeah, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So stay, now he's... Stay classy, Abraham. Right. He's on the prowl now, and uh, he's free to pursue yeah. Sash, his new... But, right. does, but does she want him? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah. So there's that. And I think that spells some danger for Abraham, to be fair. Um, I think it's, and Eugene kind of sees this as an opportunity mm-hmm. because I think he's been crushing on Rosita. I think so too. And it's like, he's there and yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah we'll see where that goes. Right. And then uh, we have the ladies as well, where there was a bit of lying happening and then um, oh, Tara is with, with her Den- name. Oh yeah. With Den- Tara. Yeah. And her. Tara and Denise. And Tara, Tara goes off. On the, at the end, right? Um, not to go back, back to Denise. So, and she she says that she loves Denise, but that she lied to her, and she drives off in the other direction. I guess what are they? Are they going to Hilltop? Yeah, they're they're supposed to be making this planned supply run. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I don't know if that's just to write them out for a little while. Yeah. But uh, but they did say they did make a point of telling Tara that. Uh, you know, like, well, you now you have something to fight for after asking right. her if th- she loved Denise. Right. So she's got. But some... there was a bit of a of a disconnect there between the two ladies. Right. As well. So um, it's it wasn't smooth sailing for either couple. Yeah, I got, I got a note down here. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, mm-hmm. Tara and Heath depart on a planned two week supply run. OK. So, yeah. So there's a separation there. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's. um. There's some disharmony. And then Carol with her her little kissy face. Yeah, Carol got a little uh, something something going on there. Yeah, it was just a kissy face. I know. But still, but still that was, I mean, for Carol. Yeah, that was a big deal. That's her, her first real love interest since Ed. That's right. She hasn't, had, Ed, she hasn't had anybody since Ed. That's right. Ed the charmer. Ed, Ed, <laughs> yeah. Ed the abusive husband charmer. That's right. Way uh, back in the season well, one. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, and he died what like in the third episode or something. I want to say it's really th- early, third or fourth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been a while. She's probably like, yeah, it's been a while. There's been some sparks between her and Daryl, but right, nothing. No, neither of them. End. Yeah, neither of them like act on it. Nope, never. So, so yeah, that's which, which <laughs> really again, which again hints at Daryl's possible sexuality. That's true. No, he could be just asexual. True. Or just not interested at the moment because of right. things going on in his head. He's yeah. just screwed up. Mm-hmm. So there's that as well. Yeah, he probably has some stuff to work out, I'm sure. Well, yeah, he's got aggression issues. Yeah. So uh, that was the episode. I mean, I... Yeah, we did get the introduction does... of Alicia Witt. That is true. Yeah. She, yeah. I don't as know. Uh, the bargaining... Yeah. Yeah, but, right? yeah, she's yeah. the voice of the radio that comes over and says, yeah, yeah well, talks to Rick and says, now, well. Have you seen the preview of next week's episode or the extended preview uh, where they show their group? I saw, I, I want to say, it's, I mean, it's been since Sunday, so that's six days ago. So I barely remember it, but I did, I did see what was, what they showed, you know, next week. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and we, I mean, we get more with Alicia Witt. We actually right. get to see her. Right. So And she's um, bargaining and she's looking through binoculars at Rick's group. Right. And telling them, you know, and, you know, she knows that Rick is not going to pull the trigger on their guy if she's got Carol and Maggie. Uh-huh. <laughs> and she won't hesitate to pull the trigger on Carol and Maggie. So that she does have a bargaining chip there. Yeah. So, yeah, I've kind of you know, like followed Alicia Witt here and there over mm-hmm. the years because I first saw her on Twin Peaks back in the day. Right. Back in 1990. That's kind of where she got her debut mm-hmm. as uh, one of the Hayward, Donna Hayward's sister, younger sister. Mm-hmm. And uh, so like I, and then I saw her like that, that Sybil show with Sybil mm-hmm. Shepard and then other stuff that she's done. And so it's just like now all these years later, here she is in the walking dead. Right. I, I saw her, I think the first time I saw her was... Looking on, a bit uh, rough, I might add. Oh, yes, very. Why do they always look like their hair is wet? I don't know. Well, you know, but it's supposed to be greasy and stringy. Sweaty? Because they haven't oh. had shampoo, I'm guessing. Okay, but, all right. Yeah. Uh, I remember her from um, two... Oh, crap. Um, two Weeks Notice? Okay. Is that the name of the movie? I don't know. I don't see Grant and, and Sandra Bullock. Maybe. Yeah, she's this bitchy chick that takes over for Sandra Bullock and right. she tries to squeeze in there and everything. Um and she was really bitchy in that movie, but <laughs> I was being impressed with her performance. So. Right. She's very good. Yeah, she should, she should be a good villain. Yeah, like I think a good she would. like a little underling to Negan. Yeah. I can see her being really really good in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we'll see. So, we'll see where that because I think her character is new for the series. Yeah. she's not in the comics. Yeah. No, I don't remember her in the comics yeah. at all. Yeah, so we'll see. Although he does have people around him, right? It's just not this uh, character. Unless they gave like they feminized one of the uh, characters, right. the male, the male characters, like they right. they made one right. of the male characters female. Right. So yeah, who knows? We'll find out. Um, it just may be one of those generic people, but they promoted them in order to have someone on the show right. as a go between. So, all right. So what did you give this episode of the walking? Uh, I gave this one eight and a half out of cookies, eight and a half out of 10 cookies left on Sam's grave. Oh, I gave it. And, eight he's, eight and, and he's in the grave going, mom, mom, yeah. <laughs> mom, <laughs> mom, mom. And, and his mom's in the next grave over going, shut up. Uh, shut up already. <laughs> Um, I gave it eight and a half welding torches and that's the, there's a little, uh, lamp shade hanging on that yeah. for next week. And if you know what he's building, I, know I do. I know what he's building. Yeah, I, I do too. Cause I have the internet, so I know what he's building. Yeah, me too. Should we talk but about But I'm not going to say anything oh, okay. cause it's a spoiler. Okay. So. All right. But if you saw the episode that was focused around him, you probably know what he's building. If you know. really want to know it's out there, you should be able to find it like that. Right. Okay, so next, Lucifer. Yeah. Uh, season one, episode seven, Wingman, which is a pretty cute title for this episode, I have right. thought. Yeah, written by Alex Cat Snelson. That's a weird name. Uh, yeah. Directed by Eric LaSalle. Mm, from ER. 
Yes. Interesting. I thought I knew that name, but I couldn't remember exactly where. So thank you. You just reminded me. Sure. He directed some episodes of Under the Dome. Oh, that's how you know him. No, I know oh, him you know from ER. Oh, you know him for ER, but okay. Because I knew of, him. Because of he... Under the Dome, you know he's a director. Yeah. I gotcha. Exactly. Uh, so uh, my story titles. She is the wind beneath his wings. She is the wind. Be- You're not going to sing that one? No. Okay. She is the wind beneath his wings. There you go. How's very that? nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the B story is why how hast thou forsaken me? <laughs> and the C story is Chloe's playing dirty. Yes. Yes, she is. Okay. Uh, so his wings. Yeah. Definitely the same plot. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, it's the obvious, which is interesting. It's like, instead of doing the normal police procedural, I mean, it is, it is a procedural case, but it's actually the mythos. Right. This episode, which is good. Right. It's Palmetto. Right. That's that she's true. looking into and right. his wings, which he's looking into. Right. But the Palmetto case is pretty much the B story. Mm hmm. Yeah. So uh, they're both they're both part of their mythos. Yes. Because Palmetto is the case that makes it so no one wants to be her partner. Right. Which is why he is able to be her partner. Yeah. And we did get a, a bit at the end. That ties it into the mythos. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then the wings, of course, were his m- missing. Yes. Yeah, it, it follows up on la- last week's episode mm-hmm. uh, where. And it, he pops to it right away that the, the nesting dolls weren't the only thing in right, there. Right. Uh, but yeah, Lucifer's still on the manhunt for his wings. Uh, he and uh, Mazikeen are like torturing people. To right. find out information, it's they're right. not really getting anywhere. Right, and uh, he tells Chloe, he yep. says, "You know, it wasn't just nesting dolls. My wings were in there." Right, and she laughs it off, and then she oh, says, Lucifer, "Oh, Lucifer, you're just so crazy." <laughs> right, and then she finally says, "Oh, oh, you're serious." <laughs> yes. yes, yes, I'm serious. My wings are in there, and I'm trying to tell you this. <laughs> right, and she puts out an APB on the wings, which is kind of funny. And, right. Well, she does it thinking, I mean, calling thinking, all cars, calling all cars. Be on the lookout for angel wings. wings. <laughs> right. Well, she does it thinking that maybe they're just really expensive cosplay or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, but it's maybe. funny when they get a hit. Yeah. Because then everyone believes that it's something that belongs to him that actually is expensive and you know he needs back exactly so that's when they start looking into it and he it he he stops being her partner at that point because he's got his own agenda right she goes off to do her thing and he goes off to do his thing well he's got he hooks he gets tries to get amenadiel's help right right it's funny because he goes and talks to chloe yeah and he chloe says well maybe you should uh throw things onto someone and, and bounce them off of them. And, and she's trying to get him to talk to her about it. Right. And he says, you're right. And then he gets up and he goes and talks to Amenadiel and yeah. leaves her alone. Well, yeah. She wants his help for her case. Right. But she, he's just like, screw that. I've got right. this. So yeah. Okay. I'll go get Amenadiel, the archangel of exposition. Exactly. Can, as I commented on Twitter. Right. Uh, who looks mighty fine in a suit, by yeah. the way. And uh, <laughs> I keep talking to to other women that watch the show. Yeah, along with me, and we're all like, "Oh, DB Woodside. Oh, Tom Ellis. Oh, <laughs> am I right? Yeah." And apparently, no love for Kevin Alejandro. No, I'm sorry. No, yeah. not really. I mean, he's cute, but but, but compared to yeah, compared to those two, no, yep. I'm sorry. Those two are like you so. Know. What? So how would it? So how would it how would it go if Matt Ryan showed up as John Constantine? <laughs> oh, you've already come up with that episode in your head. Exactly right, and it would oh, be this. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's what it would be like right there. And it would be uh, D.B. Woodside would be like, I don't know, on bass guitar, Tom Ellis playing the piano and singing. And then uh, Matt Ryan, what would he? It, he's, he's, not, he's, he's not in a drummer. band, right? He's not the drummer. drummer. No? What does he do? Is he well, a guitarist? Well, well, I just know from, you know, Constantine, he was the lead singer of Mucus Membrane. Okay, so he would be the singer. Okay. But, but Tom Ellis can sing, so I don't know how that would work. He plays the keyboards, and he could be backup. That's true. Well, you know, uh, Lucifer plays the piano. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Maybe have you yeah, had, like, yeah, occasionally it'd be like, you know, the Eagles or something, where you have more than one lead singer. Of course. Yeah. Or Beatles. Yeah. True. Good. Good point. Oh, I have a thing for bad boy rockers. <laughs> Especially if they're Brits. It, yeah, doesn't matter which. Doesn't matter at all. So anyway, I'm sorry. You've got a little bit of... Uh, what is this bizarre segue? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. You, I've got and, a little bit of Blaine. And there's another one right there with Blaine. <laughs> so that doesn't help no. the situation. No, David Anders doesn't do it for me oh, at all. Okay, so it doesn't... No, not at all. Okay. So, um, sorry, you got a little distracted there, didn't you? Yeah, sorry about that. That's okay. But anyway, so, uh, so anyway, the wings end up at this they, charity auction. Charity auction? There's no well, charity well, involved. Okay. In well, that. not a charity auction, but in an, an auction. auction. An auction, yeah. Yeah. It's an auction. <laughs> that guy is in it for the cash. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So uh, it ends about in a, religious in a relics. Paranormal yeah. auction. Yeah. yeah. And they they go there with the premise that he's going to try and sell his coin. And it's that coin that he's been playing with in every episode that floats and right. all that stuff. Right. And so the guy is definitely interested. And once he tries to sell it to him, he says, well, guess what? Psych. Yep. And he says, I want my wings. Right. Now, I'm going to give this again to you. Mm -hmm. Again, he stops them from shooting right stops them so there is no chance of them shooting him amenadiel's them amenadiel's okay with them okay getting stopped but he lucifer right takes it out of the equation he says no just give me a chance to buy them back well, Amenad takes... amenadiel has warned lucifer that he's going to end up back in hell if he gets shot i know so, so it, lucifer we'll run back to that right but Luc so lucifer thinks anybody can kill him Yes, but we still haven't seen anyone get near him. No. Except uh, for Amenadiel and Chloe. Right. And we know Amenadiel is also magical. Right. And Amenadiel has only like given him like bruising and stuff like that. But I think with Amenadiel and Chloe, I think Lucifer has it in his head that anybody can hurt him. Exactly. So he's just now now, now he's like, you know, okay, I gotta And see my theory is that they're both magical, and that's why they can hurt him. Right. Which is a good theory. But no one else has tried. He's always scraped by without them shooting a bullet. So, or something anything. always happens where, yeah. Right. To avert that danger before. Because he's afraid he's mortal. Divine intervention. Right. And I think this is setting it up where Amenadiel now thinks that he's mortal and can be shot. And so Amenadiel is going to put him in harm's way in order to get him back to hell. Right. Because I would think, yeah. Because if Amenadiel really wants Lucifer back into hell, if he does get shot, then sure. That just solves right. the problem right there. Right. And that, this is when Lucifer is going to find out that a normal mortal can't harm him. That's what I think is going to happen. You will see. Right. Oh, please, please, please. That would be awesome if you're right about that. Well, all I know is I'm going to give myself a little pat on the back here. You... I was saying since last year mm. on the Castle podcast that there was something with his watch, with his missing time. And you... You caught it. And this this last episode, he had pawned the watch and it had a and a tracker in it. Ah. And it had something to do with his missing time. And it was like a whole year payoff. So you were me. like, aha, I called it. Exactly. And I got serious props for it. When in, we in your face, Jesse Jackson. Oh. Well, yeah. But they, <laughs> they gave me props for it. Okay, so. that's good. I was very happy. It was a year-long payoff, but I, I called it. And I, I stood by it. The whole time. So good for you. So I'm really hoping that this is the case. Um, but yeah, that 
And it turns out, and Amenadiel was always top on my list of who took the wings, mm -hmm. which turned out to be the case. Right. But I couldn't figure out what his motivation was. And now we know. His motivation was reverse psychology. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Well, what I have it, what I have here is that, um, yeah, Amenadiel orchestrated the, uh, the stealing of the wings to inspire Lucifer. To make him want what he didn't have. Right. So mm -hmm. then, uh, but then Lucifer is like, no, screw that. I'm never going to return now. Right. And then he sets the wings on fire to prove his point. Right. Which is this like interesting decision. Right. I go through now, all this trouble to get the wings back. Once I get the wings back, flame on. Yeah. But once he gets them back, that's when he finds out Amenadiel took them. Right. And he realizes that that, that was his plan all along <laughs> to get him to go back to hell. And he has to do that in order to foil Amenadiel's plans. And then Amenadiel gets now, all huffy and storms off. And, and that's like, what he like, I, I will do whatever it takes to get you back into hell. Right. And that's when Amenadiel realizes he can get him killed and then he'll just go right back to hell. Right. However, Mazikeen had to clean up his mess on the beach. Mm hmm and in doing so, I'm guessing that's where she got the stray feather on the beach, or did she have it already? I well, wasn't sure. I was kind of. Here's my theory on that. Mm -hmm. My theory is that remember, Amenadiel approached Mazikeen. Mm -hmm. So maybe Amenadiel was the one who went to um, his storage locker, mm. took the wings for Amenadiel. Amenadiel gives them to the auctioneer. And she, yes, an insurance I, policy. She, she's, yeah, she's playing both sides. I see. Or yeah. she, or she's, she wants Lucifer back in hell too. So right. She, so oh, she, she does. so she's on Team Amenadiel. Right. She wants to go back to hell. She had a great life. Yeah. In hell. So I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sold. Uh, I think uh, Mazikeen's working with Amenadiel. That's my theory I think so too. I think she wants him back in hell. I mean, yeah. but, that, I, but I think that's of... why she had the feather. She yeah. kept the yeah. feather as a souvenir. Right. Well, and I think it can send him back to hell. Mm -hmm. I think the feather can do it. Just one feather. So, yeah. Uh, and that's why hast thou forsaken me. Definitely Amenadiel and Mazikeen both working against him. Um, and the other storyline is Chloe's playing dirty, where she's trying to prove that the cop was a dirty cop. And he is on life support, so everyone hates her right. for it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, she shows and, up at the, they're having a wake. Yeah. And she shows they up took at the him off life support. <clears throat> yeah, they yeah, well that was the whole thing. They were going to have a wake, then he, they take him off life support. Right. And then right. but then, oh, surprise. A men deal. Uh, yeah, the guy doesn't die. Right. Cuz a men deal put his hand up. <laughs> yeah. Heals him. Yeah, now what's his motivation there? I wonder. That's a good question. Because now the guy's going to wake up and he's going to know the story. Well, I think I think that was part of, um, oh, what was it? That, that maybe a minute deal. Um, oh, what was it? I had this. I had this earlier and I forgot. I think it was the, that a minute deal took an, it has an interest in Chloe, maybe. Yeah, I think he does too. So then um, he's orchestrating everything. Okay. So well, he, we want Chloe to get a partner. That's right. For sure. Well, I think it was he was pushing Chloe toward Lucifer. Okay. And the the cop dying was all part of the plan. Okay. To do that, to get that motive, you know, he's he's ch playing chess here. Mm -hmm. So he got Chloe with Lucifer. Right. And now he doesn't need the cop anymore, but he doesn't want the guilt of killing the cop. I see. Being an angel. I see. So he heals the cop. Okay. And wipes, you know, like, oh, my hands are clean. I see. That's, what do you think? Is that a good like theory? Like, great. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that's my theory. I never killed anyone. Yep, exactly. My, you know, like, my hands aren't dirty. I see. Yeah. So there's the whole Palmetto thing. And Chloe's trying to prove he's a bad cop. Mm -hmm. uh, she goes to the wake and she says she's not going to investigate anymore. But she and of course she uh, is. the ex-douche. Yeah, yeah. Detec are, detective douche right they're still pursuing it but they say they're not and th they say that's the best way to pursue it is to make them think they're not uh, and he has woken up 
at the end of the episode. You just so. reminded me of something. I would think it'd be a great running gag. This is completely digression here. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it'd be a great running gag if every so often you had Trixie asking her dad, where's my chocolate cake? That would be fantastic. I think that'd be hilarious. Mm -hmm. Like at the weirdest moments, just all of a sudden go, hey, I could go for some chocolate cake, dad. Yeah. And him like <laughs> looking all shifty. Yeah. Like especially if Chloe's nearby or whatever. Yeah. I'll give it to you tomorrow. I think that would be, I just think, I just thought that would have been hilarious. Yes, it would be. <laughs> It would be. She wasn't in this episode, though. No, she wasn't. Fortunately, I miss Trixie when no. she's not. In. But to be fair, they had a. This was a heavy mythos episode. It was. So it I, was. I get it. And you know what? I really like this when they dive into the mythos, and yeah. I like seeing hers, Chloe's, as well. Yep. I do. I like seeing her backstory and why she doesn't have a partner anymore and all that. Yeah, I appreciate it too, so, which is why my grade was a little higher this time. Me too. Yeah. So what is your grade? My grade? my grade is uh, pretty obvious. It's eight and a half burning wings on a beach. I gave it nine dangling bait coins. And I also like that they use the beach because it's actually a big part of the Sandman arc that he's in is him on that beach. Right. You're right. That's where he. That's where he, Yeah. He just, you know, he's just like, yeah, during the Neil Gaiman Sandman run. After yes. leaving hell, that's what's like, well, I'm just out here. He's on always beach. on that beach. Because he's in L.A. Right, yeah. which I love. Right. And it looks very much like that beach in the comic. It looks. Right. Although like you that. do need some scenes where he's just in there at sunglasses and a lounge chair with a, what's like a martini or something. Right. And he's in like board shorts or something. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. Be... But he's always wearing a suit. Yeah. Yeah, you want him shirtless. I know you do. No, that's not it. Uh -huh. That's just how it is in the comic. Uh-huh. You were describing <laughs> I'm just teasing you. I hon I honestly don't know what he looks like shirtless, so I don't no, know. Yes, it you do, because be... you saw Lucifer naked, remember? Oh, that's right. Remember, he, he got naked for Chloe? Yeah, he yeah. wore the shirt off, so yeah. Right. And you You're seen, right. yeah. Mm. How do I remember that? Mm, I don't even care. Yeah, that's all you, dude. Uh, I know. That's on you. Yep. All right. So Gotham. Well, Chloe was naked too, so I'm just throwing that in there. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile. Meanwhile. Let's go. I'm doing that for you. I so appreciate. That you I appreciate that. that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so abort. Gotham. abort. <laughs> Gotham, uh, season two, episode thirteen. A dead man feels no cold. And that's a good title. Sometimes the titles don't make sense on yeah, Gotham. Yeah, this one obviously it did. This one does. Uh, written by Seth Boston, directed by everybody's favorite name, Eagle Eagleson. I know, I love that name. I, so I, awesome. saw the, I, saw, I saw the name come up on the credits, I just laughed. Yeah, I because love we, that. Because we've made fun of it before. It's so manly. Eagle, Eagle Eagleson. Eagleson. Dun, dun, dun. America! <laughs> America! I'm Eagle Eagleson. Yep. He lives in the nation's capital yep. and he flies a flag outside his house every day <laughs> and salutes it. That's right. All right. He's probably Norwegian. Yeah. He's, I'm thinking so. Well, I think, yeah, this name sounds like, you know, maybe, yeah, Norwegian or Swedish or some Scandinavian yeah. thing going on there. But Eagle Eagleson. Yeah. Like. Yeah. But it's okay, a cool, so it's my cool story name. Times. Yep. And here's where I'm going to sing. Oh. So the A story is cooking penguins goose. Mm -hmm. The B story is, do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> <laughs> From Frozen. Uh, and the C think, story. At least it wasn't the other song. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't Let It Go, yeah. which I'm not going to sing because I'm not good at that one. Thank you. And the C story is ready for striking matches. Mm. Yeah, there's some interesting things going on with old Matches Malone. There is. There is. Yep. So Okay, so uh, Cooking Penguins Goose. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is isn't that where uh all right, so like we start off with like Arkham Asylum. Yeah. Where like Hugo Strange is there overseeing a new treatment for Oswald Cobblepot, the penguin. Yeah. And it yeah. and it kinda gets all like a clockwork penguin. Yeah. Yeah. As I comment on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Because to I, I'm guessing it's so it's, it deals with his aggressive tendencies, supposedly. Yeah. Which, again, made me think of Clockwork Orange. It's some sort of conditioning. Yeah. Where they're making him... Video and all that and pain. Like, but he can't remember it 
once right. they take the glasses off. They they make him feel like it's a dream. So what do you think? Sort. So what do you think they're really doing to him? I don't know. I think mental Although, conditioning, maybe to put him under mind control hypnosis or something. Could Brain, be brainwashing. Now I do know, and I'm. This isn't really a spoiler, but Carol Kane is on the next episode. Oh, Gertrude Cobblepoot. Yes, Cobblepoot. So, um, he thinks he's having dreams. So probably a flashback, so hallucination, or something. They're making him yeah. hallucinate. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something going on there where he's hallucinating. They're giving him some sort of drug and they're flashing things in front of his eyes and so i don't know exactly what they're doing but they're making yeah. him see things so uh, i'm not sure what the what the actual treatment is but it's crazy town it's all it's malcolm mcdowley very malcolm mcdowley and then he starts to play duck duck goose which amuses me greatly <laughs> because as we know he did not have a, a normal upbringing. Mm -hmm. He has no idea how to play duck, duck, goose. Right. And the guy says, you're the goose. And he just says, I, I don't get no, it. No, he goes, no, I'm the penguin. I'm the penguin. Yes. Yeah. And the guy says, you're the goose. You have to chase me. And he's just lost. He doesn't know what to do. Right. And then, oh, Miss Peabody. Yeah. She's an interesting <laughs> piece of work. Scary as hell. Yep. She's like Nurse, nurse Ratchet in One yeah. Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> the duck's cuckoo's nest. Yep. <laughs> right. Um, tells him that he should go along. And instead of chasing the guy, he gets up and pretends to be a goose. So right. it, it amuses me and chills me at the same time. Now, part of the, the Mr. Free storyline is in, includes also Mrs. Peabody. Right. And Lee. Mm -hmm. Lee has been taking care of Mrs. Fries. Yeah. After she comes into the precinct. Mrs. French Fries. Yeah. Right. And they decide, uh, with Mrs. Fries actually demanding this mm -hmm. happen, that they're going to use her as bait. Right. And Lee, Lee's not happy about that. No. To bring her husband into Arkham. And I'm sure these are machinations that are at least prodded mm -hmm. by Vic, um, um, Hugo, right, right? Right. Probably calling Barnes and saying, hey, you can use Arkham if you want to get him in here. We're, we're heavily barricaded and, you know, we can, we can handle well, him. Yeah, well, yeah, because I think, and they kind of talked about this in the episode, that Hugo's whole purpose, he wanted that, um, that little cylinder the canister, the yeah. The canister of uh, Freeze's uh, little cryo fluid or whatever it is. Right. And he wanted that bad. So what he did is he, like, again, he's playing chess here mm -hmm. where he orchestrated events so that Freeze felt obligated to leave a cylinder for Hugo Strange. Right. And so he breaks in mm -hmm. to Arkham to get his wife. Right. And Hugo sets it up so that he can get out without getting caught. Leaves a car for him and leave me a cartridge yep. and I'll let you get out. And of course he does. Yep. Um, but in the meantime, uh, when they set up Mrs. Fry's, mm -hmm. they set her up and this is just sadistic in the bed next to Barbara. Right. So Lee has a bit of a run in with the comatose Barbara. Yeah, she does. And she kind of slaps her around a little bit while she's oh, yeah. And yeah. don't think that won't play in the yeah. because I'm sure Barbara is faking. <laughs> you think? I think she's really in a coma, you but that she, doesn't mean that she maybe doesn't... she'll maybe she'll remember it somehow. Right. But yeah. Right. She calls her a bitch. Maybe she remembers her voice or something. You know, like yeah. the, but yeah, it's, yeah. She, it's a little out of character, but I don't blame her. Well it, yeah, it is. Yeah. Especially when Bar or um Lee, Leslie, I call her Leslie, because yeah. it's Leslie Tompkins. Um ends up talking with Bruce and is, you know, like trying to talk him down after like, cause Bruce is like, Oh, I'm going to kill, you mm -hmm. know, matches Malone. Right. And right. Leslie's very mothery. And yeah, she's very yeah, mothery to Bruce. But not just that. She immediately turns to Nora and becomes mothering to her right. immediately. That's her instinct. Right. Uh, 
so and, and then cool. later on to Bruce. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the episode, she turns a little bit again and confronts James about lying. Right. Uh, that she she doesn't know for sure, but she has this inkling that James is lying to her. And, of course, it's true that yep. James is lying to her, but I don't think she really wants to know what exactly he's lying to her about. But she... No, but she wants him to stop lying. Right. Yeah. So She wants, she she wants, does... good, she wants the good Jim back and not she... dark Jim. Right. She does yeah. this. She's kind of and... wagging the finger a little bit, yes. Right. And as I said in our 50th episode, I think he is setting himself up for doing this thing where he forgives the vigilanteism of Batman because he knows what it's like to have to do things like that. Right. Um, so that's, that's why they're setting this up like that. He understands the shades of gray yeah. because he had to walk that line already. I was just uh, happy that uh, Bruce and Leslie Lee got a scene together. Yes, me too. Because that, you know, those two characters haven't really interacted much, if at all. Agreed. And it's just like, finally, Leslie's interacting with Bruce, young Bruce Wayne. Right. So maybe she'll take more of a, like, watch over Bruce. Mm, well, she's worried about him now. Yeah. Def yeah. So maybe, she, yeah, maybe she'll be making more appearances at stately Wayne Manor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe she will. And then let's go straight into that then. Okay. Uh, Alfred swept Bruce away. Mm hmm to where uh, it was in the Alps or something. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. The, it went over to Sweden or somewhere. Yeah, their chalet. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah. And Go ahead. It was to get away from the trauma, but also to get away from Selena, who he still doesn't trust 100%, obviously. Uh, although he really should trust her at least 90% because... Well, to he, be fair, Bruce did have his mind kind of effed with a little bit with by, oh, yeah, by a, Silver St. Cloud. And then, right. yeah, so the whole uh, thing. Well, yeah, that was mostly why he was yeah, taken and then, and then, um, to heal from that. Yeah. But it, they did make a point to mention that he didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to Selena. Right. So he was also being taken away from Selena, which was mean. Yeah. You know, Selena went out on a limb to save his life. And but, but Alfred doesn't give a crap about Selena. Nope. So it's just like, that I've been, me. so I'm looking for, Ma well, he's looking out for Master Bruce. I know, but he knows that Selena was on his side. and Selena helped mm -hmm. a lot. And I think this is part of why Selena it ends up being Catwoman. <laughs> oh, do you think it's Alfred's fault? I think it's their fault a little bit that... Because you know. because instead of embracing her, the Alfred shut her out. Well, they shut her out. Well, yeah, like but, everyone. But, is but it wasn't Bruce's choice. No. So it's it was Alfred. Point. So what you're Which saying is was Alfred. Part of why yeah. she falls in love with Bruce, I think. Oh, because, because it's forbidden love. Maybe. Mm, interesting. They are setting that up to look like that. That everyone is shutting her out, but Bruce. It's all Romeo and Juliet. That's right. Except for it doesn't end up like Romeo and no, Julie. No, no, thank goodness. No. So they end up getting back together, and I do like that we're starting to see those shades of Batman, where he he notices when she comes in the room without right. seeing her, which is great. Mm -hmm. And they have a discussion, and this is he's had a discussion with Alfred. Alfred has made him promise not to go after matches on his own. And we again, we talked about this in the 50th episode that uh, we think it's just Alfred trying to get him not to go out on his own. Right. Yeah. We I mean, and I'm kind of, you know, I, I think that's you're right about it, about this. Right. I think that um, it's all part of Alfred's plan to kind of keep an eye on Bruce. It's like he doesn't want to, like, have Bruce shut him out of right. what he's doing. So he's just kind of playing along saying, yeah, yeah, no. I will kill him so you don't have to kill him. Right. But He's let, saying what Bruce but, wants to but, hear. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. But we're going to work together. We'll get him. Right. We'll work together. But, I, but we'll... I'll pull the trigger. Right. Yeah. And really, it's not going to end up being that. He's going to no. end up calling in James or whatever to help. Right. And have him taken in. So, it, you know, he has an adult plan because he knows what's best for Bruce. Right. And that's what's going to end up happening. But he's lulling Bruce into this false sense of security, and uh, he thinks 
something else will happen. So Bruce is definitely going behind his back. He's trying to get a gun from Selena because he wants to kill matches. Right. And that is my third storyline is ready for striking matches. Uh, that is him. He is determined to kill matches Malone and he is angry. This has been building up for what the two years yes. that we had after he has seen his parents gun down in that alley. He wants to kill the guy who killed his parents and Selena is warning him against it. Alfred is warning him against it. Uh, saying I'm, that I'm it, warning him against it because I don't think that matches is the killer. Yeah. Well, that's true. I'm still uh, thinking him, but Joe chill. Yeah. Well, it's not matches. Yeah. I think we know it's not match. And something's going to happen because matches Malone ends up becoming at when Bruce becomes Batman, he uses that as one of his little aliases, his disguises, right. So that he can infiltrate the criminal underworld right. and get information when he needs right. to. So maybe they bond. Maybe something happens to matches after they become friends or something. Right. But right. yeah, he's not a bad guy. Right. Because he wouldn't use that alias if he was. a. But bad for guy. some reason, he feels like he's going to pose as matches Malone later on. So. Right. So, yeah, there's going to be some some more going on there. Exactly. Has to be. Um. But at the moment, he thinks he's going to kill. But I think right now they just don't want him to kill him because they don't think he should kill anyone because right. he's innocent still. He hasn't done anything like that, and it would change him, and they don't want him to change. Uh, they want him still to have that honorable innocence. Yeah. And uh, Now, I am kind of surprised they're not doing the Bruce hates guns. Because he's talking about wanting a gun to kill his parents' murderer. Right. Now, so don't he, you so he doesn't might... so he doesn't have his hatred of guns yet. Don't you think that might happen with this? Maybe. Maybe something happens. Bruce feels guilty about it and is like, no, no guns ever again. Now, something might happen where Matches gets killed, but he knows he's innocent. Mm -hmm. Or they're just going to ignore it. I hope they don't. That's true. They could just easily ignore it and not, you know, that Bruce is okay with guns, which is, I really hope doesn't happen, but it could. Right, right. Well, all I know is this will probably be pivotal in his, I don't want to kill anyone. Right. Morality. Ho hopefully. So uh, that's my thought, at least. We'll see, so how, we'll see how it plays out. And then, of course, Freeze. Um, the, the main storyline with Freeze is that he tries to get his wife back. He does end up getting his wife back, but his wife uh, sacrifices herself. In yeah. order for Freeze to, um, yeah, she, I guess not she to... swaps the uh, like cartridges or whatever. Right. He shoots her with the wrong thing. She ends up right. dying. So he doesn't sacrifice his entire life right. for her. So we can we've kind of gotten a little bit different from like the animated series version because Nora's dead. Right. Right. And, and she cracks into a bazillion pieces. Yeah, she's a, she's all crumbly. Yeah, it's not so good. Yeah. And he takes the hose from his gun, so it's just the well, he's hydrogen all, or whatever. Yeah, he's distraught, so he just is like, that's it, I'm checking out with her. Right. And he freezes himself, and there's no solution in it. It's just the hydrogen. Right. And he freezes himself, and so they take him to Indian Hill, where Hugo has said yep. they can't revive him. But he has had enough of the chemicals around him that he's changed his body chemistry. Right, right. And that's why he's now, yeah, he can't survive any longer outside of sub-zero temperatures. Right. So they're going to modify his suit. Yep. So now he gets his suit. And now he's going to so be So we get Mr. Freeze. Freeze as Mr. Freeze really yeah. early. <laughs> that's right. Really early. So I'm kind of wondering, like, okay, with with all the villains that are coming into Gotham now... Why would they need Batman? Because like, well, hey, we've dealt with it for like 10 years or whatever of these villains. They'll still need them. These villains, maybe they don't do much. Maybe they're still under the radar. Maybe, but I, I doubt it. They don't seem to be under the radar, really. I mean, you had Freeze going around freezing everybody in plain sight. And still kind of getting away with it. Yeah. He never got taken in. Nope. See? So they needed Batman. Okay. See what I'm saying? Oh, because he don't they don't get captured. Right. The, I see what you're saying. Okay. So yeah. they need Batman to capture them and put them through the revolving door that is Arkham Asylum. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yep. 
And see, all of these villains are going to end up coming out of Indian Hill. Mm-hmm. Right? Some back from the dead, presumably. And it's going to become this horrible city of darkness and evil. And then it's going to have to be someone rising out of it to help. Why? It's like all this rise of the villains is going on. <gasps> and wrath of them. And wrath of them. Yeah, they're, they're all yeah. wrathy now, too. That's right. Yep. And then at the very end of the episode, not only does Hugo say, you know, tell Mr. Freeze that story about him having to wear the suit. Mm-hmm. He also says that he's going to have to up Penguin's dosage and, and his treatment in order to... Um, I guess spur things on. And we also see this row of tubes. Mm-hmm. And the front one is. Surprise. Galavan. Theo Galavan. The second one yeah. has red hair. So it's Jerome. Mm-hmm. The third one only has one arm. So I'm thinking it's the guy from the past um, that Galavan talked about, his ancestor. Okay. And then there was a shot also of the lizard hand. So you think maybe Killer Croc too, but Killer Croc as well, right? And we know also that Fish is coming back as well, right? We've seen the fish. Tu- we've seen the fish tube. Yeah. So, so there's so a lot of. Can we just can we just unplug that tube? I hope so. <laughs> I don't want to see her back, please God, no. Yeah, I hope she gets frozen with one of Doctor Freeze's old Mister Freeze, Mister Freeze's old yeah cartridges and melts yeah we don't need please this. please don't bring her back i know we i know theo's coming back for sure right but i'm not saying i'm not say, i'm not saying how but i know how that's right all right so what's your rating for this i give it eight and a half punching bags and i'm right there with you uh eight and a half for me as well eight and a half armored suits yeah i thought it was a really good episode yep it it seemed to really move along and, and, it, and it was very tragic and yeah it did a good i mean i don't know what it is about mr freeze as a character but it turns out some really great batman stories it really does i, I mean really? he for what longest time you know like in the 60s or whatever in the 70s he wasn't really that much of a presence until batman the animated series mm-hmm. and then ever since then it's just been like oh that mr freeze is a character that once they started introducing the concept of his wife and that whole love story that goes horribly wrong, he mm-hmm. becomes a really intriguing character. Right. And that's what makes a good villain is a villain that you can kind of sympathize with and you can see why he does what he does. Mm-hmm. And Nathan Darrow does a really good job. Oh, he was so good. Yep. So, And he looks fantastic at the end of this episode. Yeah, he's got his hair all snowy white. And yeah, he's great. Yeah, with his I eyes love- all with contact lenses and... So. I can't wait to see what happens with him next. Yeah, I want to see. I, I can't wait to see the refurbished suit. Yeah, me too. I'm hoping. And I hope to God it has like the little like um, glass helmet, like the helmet thing over. Yeah, you know, yeah. It'd be awesome. Little fishbowl action going. And on. Uh, <laughs> B.D. Wong is killing it. As yes, he's he saying. is. Yeah, I, so I, still. I knew he was great from as a villain from like Jurassic World and all that, mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah, he's really good. Yeah, as uh, Hugo Strange so far, he's just so still in that role, and it's chilling, sinister. Yeah, yeah. he's sinister. Oh, he's so great. Yep. I love him. They they get the best guest stars. They on do the a good. Show. They do a good job. I can't. Yeah. Find, well, except for Fish, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, she was a regular. She was a regular, but still. Yeah. All right. So on to Agents of Shield season three, episode eleven, bouncing back. Written by Monica Wusu Breen, directed by Ron Underwood. Tancherowin. <laughs> <laughs> no, not Tancherowin. Not okay. No, no Tancherowins to be found. At least, all right. Not in the uh, active role here. Not, maybe executive producing, but all right. Yeah. So my, uh, I'm you, sorry. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, my story names are Back to the Beginning, mm-hmm. which refers to Yo Yo. Yo. Whereas I know her as Slingshot. Yeah. From Secret Warriors. And B story is there's a new boss in town. Mm -hmm. And the C story is a bad case of hives, which you gave me. Thank you. I'm glad you you like that one. I did very much. As soon as you said it, I was very happy. (laughs) So back to the beginning is where we meet Slingshot. Yes. Or Yo. Yeah. Natalia Cordova Buckley as uh, Yo-Yo Rodriguez. Also known as Slingshot. Yeah, the, she was really Super good Warriors. in this. Yeah. Um, 
Now, you know, the way they uh, depicted her in this, as opposed to the comic, is they had her speaking Spanish the whole time. Yeah, which bugged me. It does bug me, especially when they were not doing subtitles. Right. Which kind of bugs me when they do that, but... They did it sometimes. I think they did it just so that, like, well, you know, they could have... Just so you felt like, um, you know, like Simmons or somebody else that's around there who's like, I don't understand what's going on. Hmm. So you felt exactly out of place. Exactly, exactly. And I did. Yep. Even though I know Spanish, right. it was way too fast for me to Cause, understand. Yeah, because she's all ba 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 Right. And I caught a couple words here and there, so I, I kind of knew in context what she was saying, but not really. Yeah. I mean, just barely. Yep. So, yeah, I wasn't a big fan of that. But she was she was good. Yep. Um, I got exactly what was happening from what she was doing. Mm-hmm. And I could see that she was doing that thing where she was slingshotting back and forth. So right. yeah, because her whole power is that um, she gets these little bursts of super speed, but after like after she stops or whatever, it snaps her right back to her original starting point. Right. So like a slingshot so like or a yo yo. So right. That's where. So they it's get not it. like she's Flash. Yeah. Well, where she, she can run somewhere and stay yeah, she, there. She gets these little micro bursts, and then <laughs> yeah, and then it's like. You know, it's all keyed to her heartbeat or something that, yeah, she just snaps back to her original position. Right. Before, so, I mean, when, when she used the super speed. It's not like she always goes back, you know, when she's walking down the street or whatever, but, right. but it's just Which, when she uses her speed. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it's good for, like, disarming someone mm-hmm. or yeah. moving something or locking someone up. Or like or... a quick, yeah, quick attack. Right. You know, yeah, just out of nowhere. Right. Surprise, Punching someone sur- in the throat. A surprise attack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that came in handy a lot mm-hmm. in this episode. She was stealing arms right. and it looked like she was stealing arms from the good guys, but she was really stealing them from the bad guys, which was the main premise. Yeah. Cause it's like her okay. and her, what, her brother. Cousin. It was cousin, her cousin. cousin. Okay. Yeah. Apparently they, they're just so tired of, of the oppression down there in Colombia and Bogota. Mm-hmm. So they're like, okay, we had this chance to get these arms and get rid of them. Mm-hmm. So they're not hurting anybody in our country. Right. So, and nobody else is helping us. So. Right. And it looked like it was the good guys, but it wasn't. Yep. These, these guys were intercepting them and, and taking them and giving them to the bad guys. Right. So they thought that these powers were given to her by God. Mm-hmm. And they were explaining to her, they were given to her by pescado, which is fish. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And she was stunned to realize that. Now she's like, oh, the fish oil. Right. Yeah. And she realized that she got the powers while she was eating fish mm-hmm. and that it connected with her that, oh, yeah. it must have been those fish tacos I ate. <laughs> it was. It was fish tacos, right. she said. So. Now, one, th- one thing I thought was really interesting about um yo yo mm-hmm. all right you mentioned that you know she she thought it was god like mm-hmm. like god blessed her or whatever with these powers she wears a cross so obviously she you know she considers herself like probably a good catholic mm-hmm. i'm guessing i assume so so um but if you notice at the very beginning of this episode three months three later. months later it's like oh it's the uh, it's the mystery funeral like on uh, an arrow with a cross. Yeah, we see the cross floating in air as a, like there's like a there's a shield inside a shield ship. The alarm's going off. We see uh, a cross, you know, like a cross necklace, which I'm presuming is Yo-Yo's. I'm thinking, yeah. So it's not looking good for Yo-Yo. No, it's not. Um, as you know, then we see a shield shoulder patch, and then all of a sudden there's this explosion. Right. So it's like, oh, who's the mystery, you know, like mystery grave. Right. Like on Arrow, but on this, Arrow, but yeah. it's not looking good for old uh, Yo-Yo here. Right. Unless that's a teaser. It's a misdirection. Yep. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Which it probably is, actually. Yeah. Right. Because it seems obvious that it's her. It could be her saving someone. Mm-hmm. It could be. And somehow the necklace gets off or flies off or something. Right. Who knows? It may be zero gravity because, you know, it just comes off her oh. neck or something. But, right. Yep. We'll find out in three months. Three months. Yep. May sweeps. Just like on Arrow. Right. May sweeps. Yep. Again. Everybody's got their little mystery boxes. Exactly. So 
yeah, there's that. And I also like another thing that comes out of this episode is the the whole idea, the concept of there being a team, but a team that doesn't have to be together all the time. Right. And I do like that uh, Daisy yeah. Sky. Yeah. Uh, I call is, her Daisy now. Yeah. Because she's Daisy. She's Daisy Johnson. She's Quake. She's yeah. Uh, she's the one that that uh, proposes this. Mm-hmm. And so the, this leaves them free to actually live their own lives. Right. And yet still be part of this team. Mm-hmm. So uh, the guy that they appropriated at the beginning of the season now can go back to yeah, his Joey, own. Joey. Joey. Yeah. And Yo-Yo can stay with her cousin and, you know, have dinner. But then her. they'll just draft yeah. them when they need them. Yeah, probably exactly. at the season finale. Like, oh, there's a big, yeah, we've got a big mission against Hydra or whatever. And, yep, round up yep. the Secret Warriors team. Right. And not to mention mm. that, and this is going into the next storyline, there's a new boss in town. Talbot now right. is going to be the head of ACTU, or is that what it is? ACTUA? Yeah, the ATCU, I think. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. He's replacing. Yeah, ATC, ATCU. Yeah. Okay. So he, and he's supposedly just a face. Right. But he's reporting to Colson. But it's Talbot, yeah. so yeah, we get we get this special appearance of William Sadler as President Ellis, mm-hmm. who you may recognize, remember from Iron Man three, mm-hmm. and uh, so um, you know it's there's there's doing that little Marvel Cinematic <laughs> Universe, yes, corporate synergy yeah. thing, but uh, but it was cool that they brought him in. And Coulson's just like uh, you know, well, can we like you know be official again? And yeah. President nope. Ellis is like, no, because there's still a lot of awkwardness. Right. So, but, but, but like, to, operate. so here's my here's my suggestion. Let's make the ATCU the face, the public face. But really, you're in charge, right. and we'll have Talbot, you know, like be the official head. But he has to do what you say. Which is not going to work out. No, not with Talbot. Because Talbot is not that No, kind Talbot, of Talbot's not going to work for Coulson. No. No. So my thought is, I'm sorry. <clears throat> my thought is that Talbot is not going to like this whole arrangement of them being a team, but being spread out. Mm-hmm. Because he's used to regiment and, and a team working together all the time. So there might be some sandpapery moments regarding that oh i'm guessing one or two yeah so that's part of my concern and we don't find out that talbot's going to be the one in charge until the end but i kind of knew when that was proposed yep that it was going to be someone we knew and it was going to be someone that colson wasn't going to want to be in charge right and he, and he creates conflict so that's going to be good right it was coming down main street yeah pretty much yeah uh and a bad case of hives is yeah <laughs> You still love that, don't you? Ward, yeah. Yeah, yeah Ward. Ward, um, for those who don't know still, they're, they're probably trying to, like, what is up with Ward? Mm-hmm. We know they, ent- they called him the entity, that he was taking over his corpse. Right. Because uh, Ward was killed, so he's no longer Ward. He's just, no longer Ward, yeah. it's just, it's just Ward's body being possessed by this mm-hmm. a- entity. Now, what it is, is this creature called the Hive. Mm-hmm. Which is also from Secret Warriors, right? Who is like a member of their little like uh, Hydra group that features in the Secret Warriors series by Jonathan Hickman, and uh, he's got in the comics he's almost like this like collective entity where like he can you know like oh, project little like. Um, little particles or whatever that kind of like that yeah they kind of get into almost like a virus that he can control others with right so they're kind of like uh sentient yeah particles yeah exactly like a sentient nanovirus or something right but yeah or bacteria or something like that yeah it's weird yeah but but yeah he's very creepy character yes and i'm hoping and now he looks really monstrous in the comic yeah so i'm hoping that ha- I don't know if it will because Ward, we got to show off Ward's pretty face. Yeah, he's not so pretty. Well, you know, my wife thinks originally Ward was pretty. I did too. Until he turned not evil. Not so much and, anymore. Yeah, but well, you know, 
at first in the beginning of this episode, he's looking all desiccated and like he's all draw- his cheeks are all drawn in. So I'm guessing there's some CGI work there and makeup and yeah. whatnot, make his eyes look all sunken. Right. But you know, he's like all hungry, hungry hive Ugh, and rough. is and keeps eating of all these plates of food and he starts filling in a little bit oh you know the that little rotting shell is looking a little better by the end of the episode still gross i'm sorry still yep. gross so and he's eating all this raw meat yep. it's disgusting nom 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 yeah, it's gross yep uh so the, that's yeah kind of... yeah well oh. they, they also introduced a new inhuman right um you know they they didn't name the inhuman but uh, this guy has the uh, the ability to petrify anyone using his eye contact. Right. Now that <laughs> is a re- it's I'm presuming he's going to be revealed as the Gorgon, mm-hmm. who is again uh, he's also a group member of that Secret Warriors Hydra group with the Hive. Okay. And he originally was uh, f- he first appeared in Wolverine Volume Three Number Twenty by Mark Millar in that Enemy of the State or whatever storyline. Okay. And um. And he was kind of like this, like like a, a, a uh, like a samurai type character, ninja type character. What he had like a blindfold, but yet he could still like petrify people like Medusa or whatever, and you know turn them to stone. So, which is why they call him the Gorgon because that's what a Gorgon is is Medusa, right. essentially. Right. If you know your mythology. So, right. but here they, I think they've stripped away all the samurai stuff and just they've made this inhuman guy, a, you know, the Gorgon. Right. Interesting. So yeah, that's a little. And we have the whole Fitzsimmons plot line too, yes. where they're dancing around each other until the end. Yeah. Where Simmons breaks the ice and decides they're going to reset their relationship. Yeah. As I as I mentioned on Twitter, we got a really sweet scene with Fitz and Simmons this episode, which means next week we'll get something horribly horribly wrong where Fitz is shot or something like that. No, let's or, not. Or he gets kidnapped and sent off to a parallel dimension or something. Right. Yeah. Right. Because we can't it. have more than two episodes of them being happy. No, don't say that. That's <laughs> what they do. They, 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 you know, I know. Can't we they, just they tease up? a little and then stab the dagger right in the gut? Yeah. Well, that only started in like the second season. The whole first season, they were just normal and. Yeah. Well, the, but no, there was, there was thing. the underlying, you know, everybody was shipping them in season yeah. one. And then they. F- Simmons. Right. So, all right. So, what did you give this episode? Um, this episode was okay. I, I kind of got annoyed with like the really heavy, and we talked about this about the uh, the heavy use of Spanish. Yeah. That wasn't didn't have subtitles, so it was a little hard to like. I would have liked a little bit more comprehension in the story. Right. So I took off some points for that. Um, eight and a half, or excuse me, eight plates of food for the hungry, hungry hive. <laughs> Hungry, like hungry, hungry he, he's hungry like hungry jack hungry <laughs> that's right i gave it eight handshakes and this is a double meaning of course because fitz and simmons give each other a little handshake at the end yep. but also because colson gets a new hand right yeah fitz, was- fitz finally made uh, colson something a little more fleshy human yeah. looking Coulson's- so which means that colson can ditch the gloves right or clark Gregg can <laughs> ditch the gloves he still doesn't like it but yeah yeah all right so legends of tomorrow season one episode eight night of the hawk yeah written by sarah nicole jones and courtney norris directed by joe dante that's right of gremlin fame of gremlins fame uh the howling which is Mm -hmm. a very underrated classic from the 80s Mm -hmm. and inner space which is a great movie with uh uh, Martin Short and Dennis, Dennis Quaid. Quaid and yeah it's a great movie Brian. it's a very underrated movie I love that movie so. I love it and Robert Picardo from Star Trek Wars. yes he's, Robert Picardo he's hilarious in that yeah he is so I love that movie but yeah Joe Talente directed this episode so I was just like and uh, you can tell yep from yeah. the monster well, which, was, which was good because yeah you had monsters so it's like you got a monster episode directed by Joe Dante nice mm-hmm. exactly so very cool so my title names and yes. you helped me with this by the way uh, the A story is Bye Bye Birdie. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, that's the whole hawk. Right. The the mutated hawk storyline. Uh, B story, Mac the Knife, which you gave me. Yep. And C story, Zero Tolerance. And the bonus would be Time's Up. That was the part I gave you, yeah. And I do have 
uh, something to mention about Kronos. So please Ooh. help remember that. Okay. Well, we got the, yeah, it's right there. So. Okay. So Bye Bye Birdie mm-hmm. was the whole main storyline of Vandal Savage is in the 50s doing experiments because he has found the same type of meteorite that mutated. Right. Kendra and. Yeah, the, our little opening teaser for the episode was like there was like a bunch of teens are drag racing. You know, it's the fifties. Uh, they got Billy Haley in the comments rocking, and um, you know they're going through this like with the, this town called Harmony Falls, Oregon. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the cars blows a, one of the cars it. blows a tire, nearly hitting a strange glowing rock. And as they, of course, get out of the car to check out, you know, the meteorite, Bindle Savage just steps out of the woods like, hi, everybody. And oh, hi there. Yeah. Oh, by the way, that's a meteor. And it's, by the way, it's your destiny to find it. Yeah. And <laughs> yay. yeah. And we're thinking, I guess, that it means it's their destiny to die. But really, it's their destiny to be part of his experiment. Yeah. And. The girl who is still Your in the car. little hawk men. Yeah. Or men hawk. The girl who's still in the car. I'm guessing he just thinks she's dead, mm-hmm. so he leaves her. Right. And she's not, so he leaves her behind. Uh, now, they land there because Gideon, mm-hmm. the new upgraded Gideon, has the information that he is in the 50s. Yeah, there's like some murders going on in the 50s, so Gideon thinks, well, Savage is involved. Right. So. And they're really not murders. He's taking these people and right. doing experiments on them. Uh, and they have been turned into these monsters. I mean, hawk monsters. Yeah. And he is not letting them free, except for they... At first I thought they were man bats. Yeah, but they're hawk... Would, but that's okay. That's yeah, they're hawk man Yeah, they're things. man hawks. He's trying to make hawk men, I guess. Yeah. Because he thinks that if he kills them with the knife, he'll absorb their life force, I guess. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So he's he's trying to... He's become stronger do, through that. Right. He's yeah. trying to do this experiment. But apparently, it, since it's not the exact same meteorite that damaged him, they're not exactly the same. They're becoming these weird, mutated, monster hawk right. people. Right. And he's kind of keeping them chained up in this weird wing of the hospital that yeah uh, hall h which i thought was a hilarious little nod to hall h at san diego comic-con yeah they talk about like oh it's restricted and you know like it's really hard to get into right and i just i just laughed at that i was like very clever very meta yeah very meta so well played there yeah, no one wants to go there. <laughs> I, I saw what you did, Legends of Tomorrow writers. Yeah, it's very great. It's I like great. It. Yep. Uh, and that the all, nurse is always afraid of Hall H. Yes. Which I think yeah. There's funny. all these like strange people or whatever they right. said. Yeah. Weirdos. Yeah, weirdos. That's yeah, something like that. So that Are was you pretty. Freaked out, freaked out by Hall H. Yeah, that that was pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we got we got the group. They arrive in 1958. And then they like break off into little like each everybody gets a mission, right? And they like they split off. Uh, Ray and Kendra pose as a married couple, purchase one of the victims' houses. Mm-hmm. Um, Professor Stein poses as a doctor with Sarah Lance as his nurse. Yeah, which is that's pretty an interesting. Thing. And that was pretty hilarious because like you know he's all like, "Well, why don't you give me a cup of coffee, nurse?" And he, she's yeah. like, well, "Get it yourself." <laughs> yeah. I like that he says, I feel like a cup of coffee. And she's like, me too. I'll take it black with cream. Right. It was great. (laughs) That was great. And then um, Jax, who has the really hard job. I mean, it's awkward for him. It is, actually. And one of the things I loved about this episode, um, there's obvious social problems with someone like Kendra and someone like Jax going back to 1958. And Sarah. And Sarah, right. Right. So they didn't, but although Sarah is easier to be more covert about it because she look, she's a looks like a white woman, so it's easier. For yeah. Her. But there's still sexism issues too. It's not just right. It's not just her being attracted to females. Yeah. It's also her being right. female. So yeah. So we we've got issues of sexism, racism, uh, sexuality. Right. That and legends, you know, to their credit, 
They didn't shy away from it. They no, just they dove right in. They did. And tackled it. And it's like, yes, we know this is going to be a problem. Let's explore that. Mm-hmm. So kudos to them for not being afraid of it and, and trying to work around it. I agree. And they they really went for it with the racism mm-hmm. in this episode. And it was, yeah, I mean, you know, you had Jack, they had a scene and Jax ends up, like, and that's where I was headed, was that Jax is supposed to infiltrate the local high school to look into these three teens' disappearances. He ends up going, like, to the malt shop or whatever. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like, there's this girl. She looks kind of upset. So he kind of, co- Betty, and she cozies mm-hmm. up. He, he cozies up to her at the, at the, um, you know, the counter. the counter. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like, is like, you know, the, he reaches out to her, tries to become her friend, uh, getting all kinds of dirty looks in the process. It gets down to the point where the people next to her leave because she dares to put her fry in his milkshake. Right. Yeah. That's it's the, down to that bad. Well, and, and yeah, and back then and it's a huge scandal. Right. And two of the jocks from the school, they start to pick a fight with him. Mm -hmm. And then the really bad part comes when he is trying to get her to the hospital. Right, after she gets injured. Right, and and a cop pulls him over. And instead of getting her to the hospital, Mm -hmm. he feels like taking him in. Yeah, he slams him down in the hood. Right. And so how, like, how many Black Lives Matter resets did you get watching that scene? Right. Because it's like, wow, we've come so far as a country, haven't we, since 1958? Right. And it's very unsettling, but that's a right. good, that's good. You should be unsettled by that. That's right. We really should. Uh, and I, I feel like I should be ashamed. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I, I'm not. Well, well, you shouldn't have guilt over that. but Right. Because I'm not like that. Yeah. But our country still is. You, feel, you feel bad that, the, the, that people go through this. You sympathize. Yes, I do. Right. Do very much so, and then there's Kendra and Ray, uh, who try to buy this house. And the realtor, once she realized that Kendra is not the help, right? Well, that was at the party. They're- no, the the realtor says that there is a live-in thing above the garage for the help. Oh, oh, oh! Kendra but, says but, she's not. But there the was help. also at the party though, because yeah, uh, like one, the, of the, one of the ladies at the woman uh, asked Kendra to bring her a drink or something. Right. And she says, well, why don't you go get it yourself? Yeah. Yes. She's mistaken for the help several times. Right. Uh, and Kendra stands up for herself, mm-hmm. but there is definitely some some scratching and clawing done there. Mm-hmm. And that's also fairly realistic. She has a better path because she has Ray to stand right. by her. Um, in, in And to show you how cool Ray is, Ray's just like... You know, just he doesn't even blink. He's not intimidated by it. Mm-mm. No, he's just he's he's right there with Kendra supporting her. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just so I thought yeah. that was good. He knows it's going to happen, but he just doesn't even he blink. Doesn't, he doesn't care. Nope, doesn't care. And if they come up against something, they're going to deal with it. Yep. And yep. poor Jax is on his own and he's young and he has no defense against I, it. I'm kind of surprised they left Jax alone. Yeah. Because. Yeah. He would have the hardest time, I would think. Yeah. Of I would. All the, and he did. He, yeah. he got it pretty brutal in, in a couple times. Yeah, he did. Um, when he was taken by that cop, yeah. it was bad. Yeah, you're like, oh, this is not going to be good. Yeah. And that's the cop, of course, but knew then, that Vandal was doing these experiments, and he ended up taking right. Jax to Vandal. Yep. And then, now, then, then, then Jax ends up mutated as a result. Right. I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. So... Professor Stein and Jax can't do anything on their own? Or can I, Professor Stein do something on his own? He can't. In the comics, yes. In the comics, right. either one of them should be able to trigger the Firestorm a bonding. Right. The Matrix. The, they both have the ability to become Firestorm. Or you right. know, like to draw the other from wherever they are. Right. In the comics. I don't know why they're not doing that here, or maybe they just don't know that they can yet. Well, Professor Stein can do stuff on his own because he absorbed right. all the stuff from that orb. Right. Now, what 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 I was but, wondering, though, about this episode is when Jax became a monster, why wasn't it affecting Professor Stein because of their bond? Right. Like, well, he said that he wasn't able to to hear him, yeah. connect with him. So there's that. That was affected. Um but you think it would you think it would have taken on some monstrous tendencies himself, something. right? Right. Yeah. Um, 
the one thing that I was wondering is why didn't he like rage out and get out of the bonds in the chair mm -hmm. when Vandal was trying to inject him with the stuff? And I was like, what? maybe he was weakened. I don't know, but maybe from the transformation, I don't know. It's yeah, good, it's I good, could, it's I a good get question. It. And then um, yeah, then, anyway, and then he, yeah, and then meanwhile we had Sarah, yeah, who gets himself in a little bit of a relationship or a love interest in this episode. Right. Yeah, uh, she and another nurse end up kind of bonding, and Rip makes sure to tell her, please be careful, because you're in the 50s, and you're going to leave here, and she's going to be left behind in the 50s being mm -hmm. empowered. Right. And she's going to be empowered, but the 50s still aren't right. empowered. Right, it's still the 50s, yeah. Right, so she's still going to be mm -hmm. lost here. Right. So be careful. And it ends up spooking Sarah. And there there are some repercussions left there as well. And I think it's funny that she ends up having to beat down someone in front of this other nurse. Yep. And the other nurse makes fun. Well, that's what I get for falling in love with a ninja. And <laughs> there's a bit of a thing there. I and thought I, there was a really kind of um, a little bit of a... Uh, um, Reference that, you know, it didn't quite work with that time period. Yeah, uh, but still. It was a little anachronistic. That's the word I'm looking for. It's, it's kind of cute, though. But yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't too Like, old. how does she know about ninjas in 1958? They didn't have ninja stories in 1958. Sure they did. Enter the Ninja was in the 50s. Enter the Ninja? No. The movie, yes. Mm -mm. With Lee. No, Bruce Lee was from the 70s, dear. Was he? Yes. Oh, all right. Yep, and that was Enter the Dragon, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, but Bruce Lee was Bruce Lee was from the seventies. That's seventies, yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah, so they didn't have ninja stories back in the fifties. Yeah, but... I guess you're right. Yeah. Why was I thinking the fifties? I don't know. Yeah, no, no ninja. So I just thought I just thought it was weird, but that's okay. You're right. It's a hand wave. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It was cute. So Yeah. Again, hand wave. Right. Uh yeah. Uh so I'm thinking they did that in order to soften that blow. To kind of make it seem like she's okay with leaving right. her there. Um, and of course, there's some other people that are getting left with more open minds mm -hmm. in that town. <laughs> yep. So I guess it's a good thing, but it's also kind of weird as well. Yep. Uh, and there's also a storyline where uh, Ray ends up infiltrating. Yeah. The house. Yeah, um, Savage yeah. Savage has like this big old steel door, which is like you know just screams like you know secret stuff behind here. Stuff is hiding in here. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know why nobody's like going, "Oh, what's up with this door?" But Doctor Knox. Yep. And that so was, he breaks was, down. Did you catch the, the whole Curtis Knox thing? Be, because From Curtis, times? Well, no, no. Curt, Curtis Knox. Here's I the, don't hear you unless you knock Curtis. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Curtis Knox, and the reason I this is great. Um, Curtis Knox uh, was on Smallville, played by Dean Kane, who was a version of Vandal Savage oh. on Smallville. So, in a little bit of an in joke with Smallville, they decided to use Curtis Knox as an alias for Vandal Savage. Yeah, that's very nice. So, yeah, that's very yeah. nice. Yep. Cool. Yep. I like that. All right. So, and it. And they're using uh, uh, Superman. Yes. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, he goes under the door in his little Adam suit. Yep. To find out what's in there, he finds golf pants. But under the golf pants, <laughs> yeah, the dag that dagger. He swipes the dagger, gives it to Kendra. Kendra at the no, not at the party. She ends up going to Hall H. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and, and then they get they get she gets all mad because she doesn't have the right wristband or whatever and then yeah exactly or she there's like a huge long line yes. that she have to wait two days to get in yeah exactly she has to sleep on the floor yeah um but she she does a little come on to Knox saying that she's had dreams about him she tries to play into the whole I don't know who I am yet mm -hmm. mythos and. Vandal sees through it and ends up having taking the knife out of her purse before she can get it out. Yep. And that leads into the whole fight in the hallways with the the bat people, <laughs> the hawk people, <laughs> the hawk people. Right. Um. So the knife ends up getting taken back by Vandal Savage. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> 
exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so that, that plan doesn't exactly come to fruition. And Kendra kind of blames herself for going in by herself. And they all kind of say, well, it's not your fault. It's my fault. No, it's all of our fault. <laughs> Just don't worry about it. Uh, there's some incriminating, self-incrimination done on all sides at that point. So, um, And then the bonus, time's up, at the end of the episode. Yes. Now, oh, by the way, we don't find out what happened to... Heat wave, yeah. Mick. Rory, yeah, either. Yeah. It's, Even though was- now, now, they did acknowledge it because Jax is kind of upset. He's like, oh, we're not going to talk about this? Uh, right. That, that heat wave isn't here anymore? He's our voice. Yeah. He's, the episode. He, he's very much the audience. Right. Representative. And we don't know what happened to him. And we still don't. Now, see, this is where my bonus time's up comes in as Kronos. Mm-hmm. One of the things that occurred to me is we don't know who Kronos is. Yeah, he's, ma- he's masked. I mean, right. in the comics, he's he's this. Um, oh, I forget the guy's the character's real name. But yeah, but technically, he could be anyone under that mask. Couldn't he? It? Could be, and it could be one of our principal cast for all we know. So could it be Mick Rory? It could be, or it could be. What if it's Rip Hunter himself? Like right. another, like a future incarnation of Rip Hunter. Right. That's trying to steer his previous Rip. self and the team in a different direction. Exactly. I've mm-hmm. been thinking about that. Right. That, that yeah, Kronos, Kronos is really, yeah, a future incarnation of Rip Hunter. Right. Or could it be Captain Cold? Could be. Could be a lot of people. Right. Could be. Could but be. it just struck me that, you know, we don't know where Mick is. Yeah. And we don't know who's under that mask. Yeah. So you think maybe like you know like the time masters found him in that like may, like end. maybe maybe he was frozen by Captain Cold, the time masters or the evil time master or whatever they showed up yeah that that one guy that, they knew what happened right so they turned him into their assassin Kronos exactly it's very possible mm-hmm. lots of lots of possibilities There's here lots of armor on him so it's yeah. hard to tell his body yeah. type yep. And they do have a they have an uh, an actor's name. I'm trying to let me pull it up here real quick. I've got the actor's name that plays Kronos now. Yeah, that doesn't matter though. I mean, well, no, but I'm just saying that that they actually have a guy who plays Kronos. Yeah. Oh, hold on a minute. Like, all right, I know this is doing it on the fly, but that's all right. Yep. It just occurred to me that we haven't seen right what's under that mask, so it could be anyone, and it make it would make sense that it would be someone we know. Yeah. No, right. A, right. Now, what I've been able to track down, the guy who plays Cronus is an actor named Stephen Blum. Okay. Bloom, Blum? And, and, yeah, Bloom or Blum. Yeah, it's a, and a Stephen with a V, not a PH. Okay. So, yeah, for all the take, good, for all the good that does. But take that for what so, you will. So either it's yeah, either it's just a like a body double or you know like stunt guy or something until they do the reveal. Right. Like they did on the Flash. Right. Because they do love their reveals, these Berlanti shows. Exactly. Especially with masked people. So, yep. Exactly. And that's the, th- see, I wasn't even thinking about that until this episode. Yep. Until I realized someone's missing and someone's wearing a mask. And that's, I saw it. Yep. Huh. Huh. I think, you, I think you're onto something there. Interesting. I think you're onto something. Yeah. So I think there's someone under that mask. Now, it, might not be Mick. Obviously, it might not be Mick. Um, but I think there's someone under there that yeah. we know. I'd still so, like to think that uh, it's future Rip that's trying to correct what his previous self, what, his, his past is, self, what past self is doing. Right. And that was one of the things that came into my head as well. Is because that you notice he hasn't like intentionally tried to kill people. Right. He's just trying to steer himself yeah, away. Yeah, it's like all of a sudden he shows farming. up out of the blue to kind of steer them in a different direction. And if you notice, he's showing up at the end of all their missions. Mm-hmm. He's not showing up at the beginning right. to stop them from doing things. Yep. So We'll see. And he's left behind Ray, Sarah, and Kendra. Yeah, the Wave Rider zips off because of the Kronos attack. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Ray, Sarah, and Kendra are stuck in 1958. That's right. Left behind as what's going to be the next episode title. That's right. So we shall see what happens. Yep. So what did you give this one? To be continued. Um, I thought this was great. Again, 
Legends of Tomorrow is hitting it out of the park as far as I'm concerned. Agreed. Uh, especially with his tackling, tackling the social issues, not being afraid of it. Mm-hmm. I give it a solid nine uh, milkshakes for dipping french fries. Mm-hmm. Well, that grossed me out, by the way. I it don't does. It does. All. But that was something that was on The Flash, wasn't it? Where, yeah. Yeah. It still grosses I, me wasn't out. It, was it, wasn't Iris doing that or something? Yeah. Yeah. It's gross still. It is. They do it at Big Belly Burger. They did I, it on Arrow as well. Yeah, I don't get it, but people it, do it. I'm sure people I have do. Friends it. do it. I believe you, but yeah. I'm not one of them. Disgusting. Not my thing. Good. Ruins a perfectly good French fry. This is why we are friends. You're welcome. I give it eight even and even though I don't drink coffee. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, just I I'm friends with a lot of people that don't drink coffee. Okay, just making sure. It's my addiction, not yours. <laughs> Um, I give it eight and a half poodle skirts and I don't know why I bumped it down a hair. I thought it was really good. It's just yeah, that's eight right. and a half what that's I gave it. it. It's okay. You eight got and a half is solid. It is a solid episode. So yeah, yeah. we're only off by, you know, a point half five half difference. Point. Yeah. So we're good. It's okay. a great episode. So yeah, great. We get television. Tomorrow is turning out to be my must watch that night. It's, it's maybe the, not live, but well, that for, night. for me, it's the flash. Got to watch it live. Legends of Tomorrow, got to watch it live. Everything else, well, you know, if I, I'd like to watch it live, but if I don't, it's no big deal. I'll catch it on demand. Yeah. So I try to watch The Walking Dead live because of Talking Dead. Walking Dead Dead as well, yes. Right. Right. But otherwise. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Uh, I could leave The Walking Dead for later as long as I don't watch Talking Dead. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Sunday night. My wife, I think my wife would kill me if we did, we left Walking Dead for later. Really? She love. I mean, she's like, uh, yeah. That's that's the highlight of her evening. Yeah. Like, like tonight, we're we're rec- recording this on a Sunday. Yeah. And here, like, Walking Dead's gonna start here in an hour. Yeah. So I'm it's just so, way before that. We're almost done now. Yeah, I know. So, but I'm just saying, this, she's gonna be like, you know, like we're gonna watch The Walking Dead, right? Yes, we're gonna watch Walking Dead. <laughs> it's cool. Be cool. It's only we're gonna, eight we're gonna watch. We're gonna watch Talking Dead, right? Yes, we're gonna really? watch Talking be cool. Dead. Be cool. Yeah, it's all cool. Just be good. Be cool. We're cool, right? Yeah, we're cool. Yeah, we're cool. Thank you, Pulp Fiction. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We bad. We bad. We cool. All right. So we have a feedback from Justina. All right. I haven't listened to it, so. I'm sure it'll be wonderful as always. Mm-hmm. Hi, Karen and Charles. Hi. Happy 50th episode. Woo woo. You guys are awesome. <laughs> well, Thanks 51, for- but, you know. Thanks for all the laughs. Thanks for explaining all the comic book connections and pointing out all the cool Easter eggs. Here's to many, many more episodes. Thank you, just Agents of Thank S.H.I.E.L.D. You. came back with a pretty good return. I give that episode 8 out of 10 plates of raw meat. So we got another show employing the technique of the time jump. Three months from today. I suppose that should put us right around finale time. There's things yes. I like about time jumping and there's things that I don't like about it. Sometimes I think that it takes away from what's going on in the moment because you're constantly waiting to get back to that future storyline. Yay, Fitz and Simmons look like they're going to work it out. I'm really happy about this. The actor playing Ward did a phenomenal job in this episode. Mm-hmm. I always think it's really interesting when an actor Brett has Dalton. to take on a brand new character in the middle of the run of a show. I don't really know that much about Hive. Could you tell us a few Things about that character from the comic books. Done Why, done. yes. Where Ward slash Hive is shooting that dust out of his fingertips. Yep. Since he appears to be a parasitic organism, does that mean those little particles that he was shooting at that other guy is going to make that guy his minion? Yes, so that ultimately probably. Hive will have an army of followers? Mm. Very Let's probably. Tomorrow gets 9 out of 10 milkshake dipped french fries there you go there was an Justina awesome lot of in sync to this references week. this right. week the enchantment under the sea dance the mention of biff in the diner <laughs> this show sure does like its pop culture references mm-hmm. quote of the week is actually two quotes both sarah related raza ghoul taught me how to kill people for days <laughs> and at the end when that little nurse said i should have never fallen in love with the ninja Sarah's feelings got getting reawakened made me miss the character of Nyssa. Mm-hmm. I hope that it's possible through crossovers that the writers can bring these two characters back together again. Because I know that Nyssa misses her beloved. Being reminded of life in the 50s 
and the discrimination against gender, race, and sexual orientation really makes me appreciate the world that we live in now. It's not perfect, of course, but I really appreciate the rights we have and the people that fought to make those rights happen. Mm -hmm. This show has been on an awesome cliffhanger, and I can't wait for it to come back in a couple of weeks to see how this all turns out. (laughs) Thanks again for 50 episodes of fun, and have a super week. You too, Justina. Thank you, Justina. Yeah. You're one of the people that we know we we do this for. That's right. So, yeah, we do this for you guys. And well said, Justina. Yeah, well said. So... I couldn't remember our feedback information <laughs> in the episode, but I do have the cheat sheet in front of me. Oh, uh, you're not going to get stumped again, are you? No. All right. Uh, so you can find us on Twitter at Fandom Zone Cast. On Facebook, it is facebook.com forward slash Fandom Zone Podcast. And then email, it's fandomzonecast at gmail.com. And where can they find you personally, Charles? It's dot du- com. <laughs> as a home star runner would like to say yeah, yep um i'm of course at charles skaggs on the twitter machine right uh charles at charles skaggs on instagram mm-hmm. google plus for all you crazy kids on the google plus mm-hmm. facebook of course and my blog of geeky things damn good coffee and hot where i talk about all these comic book shows and more uh so i hope you check it out Good blog. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I say that every time. It's very good. Well, thank I... you. I try. And uh, yeah, this uh, last uh, Friday, I posted an article about why Clark Gregg really, really wants to be on Iron Fist. That's right. So I hope you check that out. Yes. He's a big fan. Yeah, apparently a really big fan, of which I respect because I'm a huge Iron Fist fan, too. And you're still over 400 followers. Yep. I'm very happy yeah, happy. Yeah, yeah, you you hooked me up. I really appreciate it. So hopefully I can get some more. I'm not gonna shy away and it's like no, I'm not gonna say that's it. No, no I I would like more. Keep pushing. You're over four hundred and fifteen yep. followers. So I'm that's... three away from a hundred of Google Plus followers. Very nice. So I'm trying to like to get that up too. But uh, I keep getting my email alert saying, "Look at what Charles Skaggs is up to today." I know. And on our Fandom Zone podcast page, uh, we're up to sixty-three likes right now. Right. We would uh, like some more likes. Well, we get lots of visitors because every. Yeah. Day, there are people that like those Fear the Walking Dead. Yes, pictures. yeah, they were, and especially Nick. They love yep. Nick from the, the Fear the Walking Dead. They do. You were you were a smart woman to post those. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so we get lots and, of visitors, and now they also like uh, Tom Ellis's Lucifer too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Karen knows her audience. Wow. <laughs> yep. That is right, and it's Cougar Town. <laughs> That's right. Our page is full of Cougar Town. Um, yeah, so... So, yeah, um, give us some likes on our Facebook page. Please do. Really, we really Facebook, appreciate it. Fandom Zone Podcast on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And you can find me at Alevaria, A-L-E-V-E-R-I-A, on the Twitter machine. And there's a link to my blog and my bio page where you can find all my stuff. And I did up my reading challenge mm-hmm. uh, goal to 350 books. Very nice. So I'm only a little bit ahead of my goal now. I'm less mm-hmm. than 20 books ahead. Awesome. Where I was like 28 books ahead before. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm 18 books ahead of my goal. Very nice. You're so, doing it. You're, you're kicking butt. Keep at it. Yes, so. Yeah. And I would like to give a very special shout out to my wonderful co-host, Karen who has been with me for 50 episodes now. Oh, that's nice. And uh, now we're starting our next 50. Yes. And I love, uh, I love doing this podcast with you. So I just want to say thank you for being doing this with me. I can't imagine doing it without you. Oh. Um, I have so much fun with this podcast. I hope you feel the same. I do. And uh, I, I hope, I I hope would... it carries off to you, the listeners out there. Uh, just that we we have so much fun talking and bantering with each other, and uh, I hope it hope you guys appreciate it. Yeah, because I know I do. Plus, it makes me get dressed at least once a week. <laughs> Stop being a slacker. It's true. Yep, that's okay. I had to get dressed twice this week. I know. I, yeah, it's Sunday. <laughs> I, that is. Please don't take I got, that. I get dressed more than twice a week. Okay. 
<laughs> Let's not. But you know, when you're just lounging around, you don't really have anywhere to go. Why bother, right? I get dressed though. I get up. I put on my yoga pants and okay. a t-shirt. <laughs> God, I feel terrible for saying that. You just blew your cool, didn't it? I did. All totally. that, all that mystique has just vanished suddenly. That's all right. So, but yes, I really appreciate you, and I just wanted, I just wanted to put that out there. Now you made me feel all girly. Oh. I really love doing this with you as well. Right. I'm so glad. <laughs> and as I do you. So we've got a ton of shows. Uh, Daredevil starts up again next week. This week? Well, this week. Yeah, this coming Friday. I know. So, yeah, you're right. This is Sunday. It's Oh, yeah, this Friday. Uh-huh. So, yeah. And we better tackle it this week because in a couple weeks, more shows. I know. All the CW shows return so are we gonna do two episodes this first week i don't know we might want to do that okay get through a couple if you want to do it it's up to you um i'm cool with it if you are if you have time for it if not that's understand because it's on friday so i don't want to push you yeah that's fine okay all right we can do it so yeah we'll look out for two episodes of daredevil season two yeah (laughs) and i'm only gonna watch the ones that we're going to talk about every week. I've At least made- it's time you get two episodes. So you can burn, you can do a little mini binge. Yep. Oh, I'm going to regret it. <laughs> I am really going to want to watch it. You're but really hey. selling this, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to really want to watch it. But we'll I see. promise, again, yeah, I've we'll only see. watched the episodes. We'll see, we'll see how long that lasts. No, it, I did it for okay. the other two shows. So. All right, all right. I believe you. But again. All right. So I guess that about it. does it. And I have a special outro. Yes. And I will play it for us. In in honor of this week's Legends of Tomorrow. That's right. And we will see you next week. Bye, everyone. One, two. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're going to rock around the clock tonight. Put your slats right so.